All right. Hello, everyone. We have, uh, we don't actually know who's out there, but uh, we're, we're really gl glad that you're here. Um, uh, my name is Phil Bourne. I'm the, the Dean of the School of Data Science here at the University of Virginia. And as you can see from behind me, well, more or less, that we are the School Without Walls. Uh, and some of you are departing us and some of you uh, are joining us, uh, either residentially, we hope soon, uh, and also online. So we're really glad you could be with us here today. Uh, I'm also particularly honored to uh, have four of our members of our advisory board here with us this evening who are going to give you their Im uh, impressions of where things are going and where they've come from and so on. And we'll get to that in a minute. But let me just say that um, I've been at UVA about three years and the, the advisory board and all the people that uh, you'll see in a moment or you see now, but I'll speak in a moment, uh, have been there uh, part of this enterprise since the beginning. And under initially pulled together by Don Brown, who those of you are here already know, and those you know, the rest of you will meet. Um, and uh, as we moved from an institute, and now we've just graduated our first class uh, as the School of Data Science, of which we're extremely proud. The advisory board has guided us through uh, all of the thicks and thin of uh, developing, uh, as we did uh, prior to being a school and now as a school. Uh, and twice a year, we all get together, uh, have a nice dinner, and then uh, sit down and really thrash through uh, aspects of what we should be doing in the forthcoming year. From the point of view of uh, really leaders in the private sector in various ways. So let me just introduce the, the speakers um, that were with us today, the board member. I'm going to do that very briefly, and I'm going to let them say much more about themselves uh, as part of the session. But I'll start and I'll go by in accordance, uh, at least introductions, by how people appear on my screen. So uh, Linda Abraham is the co-founder of two technology companies, Peregrine Technologies and Comscore, and currently serves as the managing director of Crimson Capital and vice chair of Upskill. Uh, she has a BS in business analytics from the University of Penn and at some point prior to has uh, been a skydiver. So thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm trying not to be too embarrassing by these introductions, but um, uh, I'm, I am so pleased to have these folks here. They're just absolutely incredible and top notch. So uh, then below uh, Linda on my screen is Sam Woley, who's um, a partner with uh, Riviera Partners which is a global recruiting firm specializing in the technology industry in San Francisco. Uh, he has a, a degree in computer science from Boston College and an MBA from Boston College. Uh, and he's been interested for some time now in the analytical back, uh, background of wine, uh, having read a book called Cork Dork. So uh, I share that, uh, that, that analytical interest in many ways. Uh, then uh, to his right on my screen, uh, is Rob Alexander, who's the Chief uh, Information Officer for Capital One Financial. Uh, he has a, an AB in Physics from Harvard, an MBA from Harvard Business School. And I'm so jealous about this because I used to fly Cessna 152s. He's, flo he's flown an F4 <laughs> Phantom Jet Fighter. So, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I bow down. Uh, and last, uh, and definitely not least, uh, Scott Stevenson, uh, Scott is currently serves as Chairman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Verist Analytics uh, and he's previously worked as a Senior Partner for Boston Consulting Group. He has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from UVA, uh, an MBA from Harvard Business and he's interested in historical literature. And uh, so we're going to sort of go around and have folks uh, say a few words to open up. And I know they'll say a lot more about their connections to UVA as well. So I think, Scott, we were going to start with, uh, with you. And um, so I think uh, for the next few minutes, before we get to questions that were uh, provided by uh, the audience here, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have you say a little about yourselves, uh, your career trajectory, and then really two things uh, for this particular audience, I think. Uh, if you're just starting your MSDS degree, in hindsight, from your perspectives, 
uh, what would you consider important? Uh, and then of course, on the other flip side of that, 11 months later, if you've just graduated, in hindsight, uh, what would you be looking for in a career? So, uh, hmm. you know, anything or anything you want to say, of course, but <laughs> we're, uh, I, I just know it's going to be really informative for this group. So thank you so much for being here. And Scott, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Phil. And <clears throat> it's so nice to be here with friends. And uh, I wish I could see everybody that's on the call and um, give you all a big handshake. I, I'm a big handshaker and I really sort of miss that <laughs> in, this, in this moment. I mean, we're being appropriate and following the protocols, but you know, I'm very excited for you that you're getting started here uh, on what I think will be a very, a very uh, interesting and constructive um, time uh, studying with Phil and the other phenomenal faculty that we've got at the School of Data Science. And I just want to compliment you on, you know, having made the choice uh, to pursue these studies. Um, obviously, it comes at a cost, uh, not least of which is your time. And, um, but I think that you will, I think you will find that the investment that you're making in yourself now uh, will pay dividends many, many times over as you move forward in your career. I also think you've made a great choice in uh, choosing to be at the School of Data Science, where um, we, everybody on this call has had a chance to interact with the faculty and the staff and they're top notch and leading in the field. And, um, and, and uh, Virginia first in the form of the Data Science Institute and more recently the School of Data Science has really been a leader. Um, and so um, I think you made a great choice and I hope that the coming uh, year will exceed your expectations. And I think there are many reasons to believe that it, that it will. So just a little bit about my own journey. I, I guess I would say I've always been in technical and analytic um, uh, modes in, in the, the workplace. When I graduated with my ME degree, I was working on the design of uh, missile propulsion systems, or at least parts of missile propulsion systems, I should say. And, um, uh, it was very, it was R&D work and I really, really enjoyed it a great deal. Um, as Phil mentioned, I did get a, uh, an MBA and then uh, thereafter was working very much as an analyst uh, with a company called Boston Consulting Group. And, you know, I was really the first line analyst and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I, I, I must also, <laughs> I must, I'm also struck by how much the methods have advanced through time, I was using a pack, a statistical package. I'm, I mean, like this was well into the last century, just dating myself here. But, you know, I was pioneering the use of a statistical pass package called SPSS that probably none of you have ever heard, none, none of the students have ever heard of. But it was so exotic at the time, you know, and now it's just, you know, you wouldn't, I mean, the methods are so much advanced over, over where they were. So we live in an era where those of us who sort of grew up, you know, kind of uh, in a different climate, a different environment, you know, we experienced uh, the, the productivity uh, of data analytics at, at one level. Well, you all get to experience it at an entirely different level. I mean, 20 years ago, it would have cost you $8 million to source a petabyte of storage capacity. And now I think you can get it from AWS for like $25,000, maybe less than that, you know, so, so the, the, the availability of data, the cost of being data analytic has just come down so much on a, on a unit basis. And that's why what you're studying and where you're headed is so important because it's so leveraged. It's, you know, almost every company that I know of is trying to become what I call a better digital data analytic version of itself. And, um, uh, and I think that will only accelerate, by the way, in the COVID-19 moment. Any companies that felt the grinding of the gears as they attempted to work remotely and virtually, they'll remember this time. And they'll, they'll, they, will, they will be very focused on um, how do we make sure that the gears don't grind so much if and when something like this was to happen again. And so the demand for the skill set that you all represent is only going to go up. So. Um, you know, that hopefully that's a, that's, that represents a degree of comfort for you. Um, so the only other thing I'll say, Phil, as we, as we just, as we just kick off here is, um, maybe I'll put it this way. Um, having studied 
you know, engineering. And I took a couple classes in the more liberal arts part of the university, but mostly I was doing the technical courses. And when I, when I was done with that course of study, and now I had moved out into the world, what I deeply felt was that um, m maybe I had left some of, I, there were parts, of, there were muscle groups that I had not made use of when I was a student, maybe I'll put it that way. And that sort of a rounding in the direction of just sort of a, a sort of a broader, deeper humanity, I guess I would put it, uh, was something that would be really, really helpful for me. And I can just report to you, leading a company today that tries to harness data analytics and make it, you know, make it effective for our customers. We need people who are deeply technically skilled, that is for sure. But the person who really makes a difference in a company like ours is somebody between the right ear and the left ear, there is a lot of technical, methodological capability, but there's also a deep instinct for what is the difference that needs to be made in the world. And the person who can kind of really run back and forth between those two poles effectively and quickly and often, that's the person that makes a really big difference. So as you are building your methodological skills in the coming year, just get, make sure that the right and the left brain are both fully engaged, I guess is the way I would put it. And, you know, give yourself more than permission to, you know, to ask questions like, well, why does this matter? You know, or what difference are we trying to make in the world? Those are good questions to ask. I really, really, really encourage those questions. So thanks. It's great to be with you this evening. Thanks a lot, Scott. In fact, uh, you know, I think for the new folks that are just joining us, uh, as you know, we try and embody much of what, you, what you're what you saying in the latter part there with respect to the right brain and the left brain and how we think about data science. And hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to that in a little while. I will notice <laughs> that Rob made the uh, comment that you're, uh, we didn't really know. Well, of course, we already assumed you were a rocket scientist, but now you just oh. confirmed it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow the chat more, more carefully, Rob. Thank you for that one. <laughs> uh, Sam, you want to tell us a little about yourself and give us a perspective? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Hooley. As Phil said, I'm uh, joining you from San Francisco. Um, I've been stuck in my room in the office with Stanley for quite a while, and it's getting a little old, but I'm sure you all feel the same. Um, so I have a little bit of a different path as well. I studied computer science undergraduate. And I realized I would be, I could be a good engineer. I wrote uh, software for air traffic control systems. I worked for a computer sciences corp, which is a government contracting uh, consulting firm. And I did like the consulting aspect of it. I started a consulting firm in Boston. I went back to get, um, I wanted to do something a little more, uh, I wanted to do a, a deeper dive into data. And so I went back to graduate school for my MBA, but they didn't have a discipline that was spe uh, specific to uh, to what is now known as data science or informatics. So I went to the dean and I said, here's my interest. Could I create a curriculum that would allow me, if you would allow me, to graduate? And so I was lucky enough to be able to put together a course of study that was very, uh, as Scott said, very universal. I particularly like to study a lot of different things. Um, and I was able to take classes at other colleges. Um, I was able to take classes uh, that weren't necessarily for credit to put together uh, what is now called an informatics, a data informatics uh, concentration. They don't have majors, but a concentration in graduate school. So what I what I found from that was um, I would I would I would call it the study of analytics, right? The study of being analytical, and that's what I have found to be interesting. I moved out uh, to California about ten years ago. I'm originally from the Boston area and uh, started to run a consulting and accounting firm. Uh, and I have found my way into executive search. So Riviera Partners, where I'm a, a senior partner, only focuses on engineering, data science, and uh, product development executives. If any of you attended the Women in Data Science um, Symposium, Fran Bell, for example, uh, is one of my candidates. So I've worked with her. And there are, I get to work with phenomenal people who are far uh, more accomplished and smarter than I am um, it, every day, which has been a boon for me. It's not a career I ever thought I would find myself in, but it's probably the best decision I never made for myself. Um, I would definitely echo Scott. I think that's something that uh, that I've found to be 
if there's one skill you have, it's to be able to learn, right? And things will change. You're entering an unprecedented time, but you also have unprecedented opportunity. The rate of change is faster and faster, and you're going to have problems coming at you faster and faster than they ever have. And the ability to be analytical and to have a first principles way of thinking is going to be much more important now than it ever was. Uh, so to be able to tell right from wrong, to be able to tell left from right, um, that's going to be a lot harder as we go forward. And I think that this program that you are in, that you're finishing or that you're entering will really prepare uh, you for that. It's unique in its cross collaboratory constitution. You'll get a chance to work with uh, a number of different people and disciplines from across the university. And I think that's a really unique opportunity. So take as many chances as you can and that you have to study a lot of things you never thought you would uh, or, or may, maybe not, had, had never thought you would want to. Um, but I guarantee you that you'll be glad you did when you leave. So congratulations for making a, a fantastic decision. I know you'll have a wonderful time uh, as you go through the program and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person at some point in the future. Thanks, Sam. And yes, we certainly hope we, we get to, they get to all meet you in the future. Um, uh, so Rob, um, your turn. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and um, glad we're able to do this virtually. Uh, it'd be great to do it live, but, but this is uh, second best. Um, so, uh, so a few things I'll say. Well, let me start with um, kind of where I began, which is an uh, undergraduate physics degree, which I think was a great uh, uh, you know, place to start for just a, an analytical problem solving quantitative kind of degree. I went into the Air Force for four years and worked on ICBM systems, <laughs> missile systems, uh, and uh, uh, mainly doing software for command and control kinds of systems like that, and then went back to business school really as a way to transition to the, to the business world. But again, kind of a very analytical curriculum, but from a little bit different angle, uh, this time about um, thinking about the business world, went into Bain Consulting, um, and uh, consulting was great, and, and uh, it really is about problem solving, and, and Bain was very data-driven, and so very focused on um, bringing kind of analytical thinking and clear thinking to really complex business problems. And so again, just kind of continued um, my journey along um, uh, developing analytical skills. Went from there to join Capital One 22 years ago, hard to believe it was 1998 when I joined Capital One, started in our, in our business side. And for any of you who know about Capital One, our whole founding premise was uh, what we call our information-based strategy, which was this idea that you could build a better financial services company leveraging data and analytics. It's the scientific method, it's test and learn. We would, we would run thousands of tests through um, uh, you know, mailings and policies on credit cards and all different kinds of things. And we would very carefully analyze the results, figure out what worked best and continue to, to optimize. And that's kind of how Capital One began. I like to say we were the first real big data company. I don't know if that's really true or not, but I say it anyway, because it was you know back in the, uh, in the 1980s, late 1980s, when the company was founded, and there weren't a lot of big data companies um, at that point in time. Um, but uh, so I started out on the business side in 2007. I became our um, our CIO, uh, and now my job is to lead our technology organization, uh, which is today is about 10,000 people, um, and we have an enormous army of software engineers, data engineers, data analysts, uh, cyber. Um, analysts and engineers who are who are heavy users of data and analytics um, and machine learning. We have a, a whole cadre of machine learning uh, experts and our business is one of just software and data. That's what our products are at Capital One. You know, it's, it's credit cards, it's um, bank accounts, it's relationships with customers and how you manage those over time. And it's so important to, to be great at, um, at leveraging uh, data and analytics. So, um, so I really think this is just a brilliant choice that all of you have made to make the study of, of data and analytics um, your, your vocation here. Um, and, and look, the current crisis, if there's no better kind of exemplar of how important this is to our society, the current crisis is, um, uh, is a great example of that, right? And, and the fact that you are pursuing a truth-seeking vocation at a time when there are lots of mistruths out there about, or, or half-truths out there about what's going on around this crisis is just such a great example of, of how important um, this particular skill set in this particular vocation 
uh, can be. Um, I also just really commend you on the choice of, of UVA School of Data Science. Well, I'm not an alum, I, I am the parent of an alum. My son uh, went to uh, McIntyre and also got a, a computer science undergrad degree. Um, and, uh, and I've been involved with the School of Data Science from the very beginning when it was just uh, Don Brown and Arlen in the basement of uh, one of the engineering buildings um, as just starting this thing up. And I will, I, I will say I'm just amazed at where it's come, uh, how far it's come. Um, Phil, your leadership and the staff you've built are just fantastic. Um, and having it anointed a school in such a short amount of time is really, in a, you know, where, where that's a really big deal at, at UVA. And, uh, uh, and so that's really an impressive feat. And I think it just really shows how much the whole university is behind uh, this important um, discipline. Um, you, you asked a couple of questions, Phil, at the outset about, um, you know, what's important, uh, you know, what to think about as you're starting out in this, in this career field. And, and, and Scott, I like some of your comments about this, that, um, you know, I think this is an opportunity to, to really build um, a, a discipline, a skill set around methods of inquiry and analysis using data and analytics. And there are lots of domains that you're going to get to explore this in. And I, uh, you know, encourage you to, to look at lots of things. And it's not just about kind of, can you do the analysis? It's really about, can you derive insight? Can you tell stories with data? And remember what the end is. The end is an outcome and driving change, as Scott said, right? It's really about the impact that you have. And and to do that, you're often about, it's often about influencing through people um, and not just like, uh, you know, some really, um, you know, QED analysis that you've done. You've got to translate that into how you influence and compel people um, to, to make changes and to drive action. And so I really encourage you to develop those skills because those are so important when you get into the, um, when you get into the world, whether it's business world or academic world or, or wherever you choose to go post your degree, it is those um, influencing skills, relationship building skills, and storytelling skills built on the foundation of your data and analytics that I think are, are so, so critical. Um, you also asked the question about what, what to look for in, in, a, in a career in data science. And, and I, I would say, you know, look for a place where data is valued and, and um, you can leverage data to drive change. Um, and I think there's, you will find in the business world, you will find that there, there are a vast array of companies with all different kinds of, of cultures when it comes to data and analytics. And some are really sophisticated about it and some are not. I, I, I think if you go to a company that's really sophisticated about it, you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn a lot and really get invested in that. I think if, if you go to a company that's less sophisticated, maybe you have an opportunity to really uh, drive change uh, in that culture. But, but I think it's important to really be discerning on that and think about what you're looking for um, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of where you go. Uh, and then also look for a place where, where there's leverage in the data, meaning um, you know, the, study of the, the study of the data and the, and the outcomes that you can generate can really make a difference in how it moves the business or how it moves an academic discipline or something like that. So I think that that's another kind of thing to think about as, um, a, a, as you start your career. So um, those are just a few thoughts to, to, to uh, get us started. Thanks a lot, Rob. I mean, I must say that as I listen to the three of you so far, it's, even though you're working in quite different spaces, there's so much commonality in what you're saying and, and which really resonates with what we're certainly what we're trying to do in the school with respect to training and what follows. So this is, this is great. Thanks. Um, Linda. Yes. Hi everyone. Um, I just want to apologize. I hope there will be no banging. I've got some construction going on in the background and people are finishing up. Hopefully if I apologize in advance, I'll just talk through it if it happens. But um, Thanks very much for having me. And uh, like most others here, I, I you know I've been um, on the, you know lucky enough to be on this advisory board and this on this uh, you know the Data Science Institute and, and now the school that I really believe in for for so many reasons and have just been really excited to um, like everybody has said be kind of part of this part of this ride and have been super impressed with where things are going. Um, so I also commend all of you, whether you're entering or whether you're just finishing um, uh, for, for this, on this choice for a number of reasons. So 
I'll give you a little bit of background on myself and then tell you how it is that I, you know, what my connection is to, to UVA. Um, so I started my career uh, at a time when kind of data was just becoming cool back in the 80s. I started at my earliest jobs were at IBM, uh, my internship, and then at Procter & Gamble when I first graduated. And uh, it was a really exciting time because they were just getting a whole bunch of new data streams that, and they really had no idea what to do with it. And so I was one of a, a small group of people that were hired to kind of figure it out. And at the time, uh, I mean, looking back, it was, you know, kind of to Scott's point, we were using pretty rudimentary tools at the time and doing things that would be looked at as, as very, very unsophisticated uh, by today's standards. But back then they were really, um, you know, quite viewed as quite kind of pioneering. And uh, we did things like using data to understand uh, consumer response to a varying degree of marketing stimuli. And therefore we were able to help make recommendations on how to allocate, allocate uh, you know, budgets that were in the, you know, uh, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars and, um, you know, I was doing this in when I was 20, you know, 22, 23 years old um, and was, you know, found out relatively quickly that when you bring new data and new insights uh, from that data to real decisions, you can have an impact pretty quickly on, um, on some real decisions and, and really drive um, a lot of pretty exciting things. So, um, and I have basically seen that throughout my entire career. Smart uses of data, I have seen just turn companies around, businesses around, um, launch products, you know, being the difference between, um, you know, being successful and unsuccessful is, is in many cases a smart use of data. So, um, you know, my career progression started out at Procter & Gamble and then I went from there um, uh, to a company called Information Resources in Chicago, which was, again, was all about um, and driving data and analytics and building products for consumer packaged goods companies um, using uh, all different kinds of data sources. And then ultimately went on to um, co-found a couple of uh, technology companies, uh, probably the best known of which is Comscore. And that's really where I um, uh, really first began to spend some time down at UVA. And I just want to echo um, what you know a couple of folks had said uh, particularly Scott, with regard to the sort of left brain, right brain comment. Uh, when we were at Comscore, we hired, uh, you know, Comscore, uh, when I left in 2013, had, you know, 2,000 people or so working there. And um, we had hired so many people from a lot of the top schools. Um, UVA was our probably number one in terms of quantity, but we hired from, you know, Duke, from Penn, from Carnegie Mellon, from I mean, just a whole number of schools. And I was amazed over and over again how the UVA students really stood out um, because they could do exactly what Scott articulated, which is not just understand you know, how, what to do with the data, how to build a model, uh, but they really understood how it is that it should be changing something. What is, it, what is the net impact? What, does, you know, what are you gonna do with the results from a decision-making standpoint? How are they gonna improve things, make things more efficient, make things better? And, um, and UVA students just, seem to be able to do that really, really well. So, um, you know, we very uh, early on developed a, you know, quite a strong partnership with, um, with UVA. And uh, I ended up being so impressed that two, two of our, our younger two kids um, went to UVA. And, uh, and then I had that experience, um, you know, really up close and personal in terms of seeing how they progressed, uh, the kind of education that they got. And um, one was in, in, graduated from McIntyre and one is actually uh, doing data science today. He was a systems major, but um, did a lot of data science stuff. Uh, Don Brown was his advisor. And um, today he is doing really cool stuff at, uh, at MITRE with regard to data science and, and data engineering regarding COVID. And you know, he's only been in that job a couple of months, but just to give you a flavor for um, some of the work that you're doing and where it might end up, um, I think he was working at the company maybe, you know, three, four months when this whole COVID thing hit and they pulled him off of everything he was doing and put him on a COVID project. And I don't know if you remember um, when President Trump was originally saying he was going to open everything up by Easter and, every, and, uh, and, uh, and there were a number of models, apparently, 12 different models from 12 different sources that were kind of brought to bear on that um, 
kind of shown to him. And uh, I guess between the 12, that was one of the, supposedly, one of the, uh, the things that changed his mind uh, and kind of uh, made him really understand what the projected impact of this was going to be and that opening it by Easter would, in fact, not be a good decision. And so uh, my, one of uh, the models that, that my son Brendan worked on was one of those 12 models. And so you can really see how quickly uh, doing you know, smart things with data can impact, you know, major decisions in, in a very short period of time. And so, you know, I share that example to say, um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that he was doing what you're doing. And now just, you know, less than a year later, he's, he's really, um, he's building, doing things with data now that are going to be used by all sorts of state and local government officials. And it's all because of what he learned at, at UVA. And um, so I'm, I'm just a huge fan. I think that this is an incredibly interesting time uh, to be entering the field, um, I think, on, on so many levels, because not just because of the availability of data, but because of um, the way that it is uh, impacting society, the way that it is impacting um, uh, global, uh, global economies. Um, the way that it can actually change either for better or for worse um, things like you know supply chain um, all sorts of policy policy decisions that have to do with basically how the world is going to be run so from an opportunity standpoint i, I really feel like um, somebody with a data science background is going to have so many opportunities to, to change the world in a positive direction and the other comment i want to make is that never before has it been so important to have data science um, uh, you know, people with strong data science backgrounds also really have some training in the thought process around uh, the ethics of data science. That's a really important thing that we're facing. We have, I'm sure you've all heard about a lot of the, um, you know, contact tracing um, types of things that, uh, types of applications that are out there, where, who's going to own that data, how that's going to flow, what it's going to be used for. And so, um, you know, bringing to bear thoughts, not just around what the model should be and how it should work, but how it should be used and to be able to articulate uh, you know, your point of view in that discussion. It's just a, it's just, just a fantastic opportunity. So um, very excited for all of you in some ways would love to be in your seats because I think the future is just going to be, you know, really even better. And um, the two things that Phil, I'll close with the two things that Phil wanted to uh, talk about, which is um, one of them was, um, you know, what to look for and, uh, you know, saying it uh, maybe in an adjacent way to what, what Rob said, um, I think you want to be at a company or I think you'll find the opportunities to be the most broad and the most compelling when, you know, data science is kind of in the water supply, basically. It's, it's some companies are still looking at data science in a, in a silo and it can be kind of a lonely position. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that I remember when I was, um, you know, contemplating whether or not I should leave Procter & Gamble, um, a data scientist was talking to me, was trying to encourage me to, to come and work for his company. And he said something that I've always remembered, which is, uh, you know, remember that at Procter & Gamble, um, you know, how much soap you sell makes the stock go up and down. And if you come and work at this other company, um, what you do will make the stock go up and down. And that really resonated with me. And so I think as you're looking for opportunities, making sure that you are going to a company that um, where what you do really matters, um, matters in a way um, that will be, you know, ultimately meaning for you, whatever you decide that is. Um, so I think I'll, I'll close with that. I think I've taken up enough time, but thank you all. Couldn't be more excited for you. Well, thanks a lot, Linda. I have to say that uh, listening to you <laughs> it made me all realise how old I am. Uh, I mean, SP, SC, S, S, SPS have been around for a long time by the time I, I was actually, I, I go back to the era of punch cards, which we won't, <laughs> we won't, we won't even get into. Um, but I, you know, and, and every year I'm, I would say I'm equally excited by saying, wow, I wish I was just starting out now because the, the, the level of, of possibility just seems to ramp up with each each new graduation class. Uh, oh what, what can be accomplished? I'm I'm going to digress from the script already, uh, as one is wont to do, 
because there's, I think, an interesting conversation that's going on in the chat, and it, and it sort of builds, I think, one of the things I've taken home from everything that you've all said is that, you know, the analytics and piece, of course, is that's core training that we do, but it's really so much more than that and how you apply and how you think about it and the benefits that it has. And part of the conversation that's going on now relates to how you communicate that within an organization um, and how you, you really make a difference, not necessarily at society, but within the organizations in which you're working in. How you, you know, how you uh, garner the attention of your peers within the organization and your, those above you and, and so on. And so that communication piece is something that's really, I, I, something we try and, uh, and the students who are just coming in will soon appreciate is something that we really put a lot of emphasis on. But I, I'm just wondering if you, any, any of you could sort of relate to the importance of that and any, any thoughts about your own path there and, and really uh, any advice that you can give uh, to, you know, to really communicate what it is you're doing in the, in the, in the most uh, meaningful ways. So I'll, I'll start with a couple of comments on this. You, you know, I, I've learned a lot over the course of my career um, how to communicate you know, analytical information and, and um, analysis and things like that. And, and you know, I, I, early on, I used to think, wow, I just need to really sound smart and have really complex graphs and, um, you know, it'll be so compelling and, and everybody, you know, thinks like I do and, and they'll totally get this analysis and think that I'm really smart for having done it. Um, wow, I just realized, you know, <laughs> over the course, you know, I, I learned this in consulting, but I would say I, I've especially learned at Capital One that it is not about that at all. In fact, the best presentations, we, we obsess about communications and we are a PowerPoint, un, uh, you know, unapologetically a PowerPoint culture at Capital One. That's how we communicate. Um, and uh, it is really, you know, we, we push it to, to an art form in a positive, in I, what I think is a really constructive way, which is really, really pushing on the, the compelling logic of the story, but in slides that, in, in ways of communicating that are ultimately strikingly simple, right? The, 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 how we tell the story, the slides themselves make really crystal clear points that are really, you know, kind of one key point per slide. The graphs are, you know, there may be really, really complex analysis behind it, but they are stunningly simple graphs, you know, that, that um, make a point, make it really clearly and make it clearly, um, you know, so, so uh, the, the uneducated, you know, I'll give you an example. We, we, we talked to our board of directors who are highly educated people, but they're, they're all from different industries and different backgrounds. And so they don't always have the vernacular or the context or all the detail about specifics of our industry. And it's a really good test to, can you really tell this thing in a way where, where you know, a smart consumer of it, who's not really familiar with it, can really get compelled by the arguments and the points um, that you're trying to make. And so I think really working backwards from uh, from the audience, really working backwards from the, the, the points that you're trying to make and let the, an, let the analysis and the data support that, but don't, don't, don't just have it as a, as a crutch or the, the end in, in and of itself, I think is, is, uh, is so important. So that's a little bit of my journey. And I recognize what I'm talking about is kind of PowerPoint specific because that's the way um, that we communicate, but, but so many businesses um, leverage those similar kinds of, uh, kinds of tools and approaches. No, I think, you know, it's, you've made some really important points there. I mean, I think it's really important to understand who it is you're talking to <laughs> uh, and talk to that audience and uh, at the level at which you're going to be able to get the message across. Um, other thoughts on, on this particular point before I move on? I'll just yeah, throw I, out. Oh, please go, go ahead, Scott. Scott. No, go ahead, Scott. Well, I was just going to throw out that um, uh, it's probably the case for most of the most of the people that are about to enter the program that in the early stages of your career, you will you will be doing this knowledge work that we're talking about. It can have two objects. One could be that the the that the the product of your knowledge work itself is the thing that your company sells and gets paid for. 
My guess is that will probably not be true of most of you. There are some businesses, they do data analytics. Ours happens to actually be one. Um, but most, most of you, I think, at least at the outset of your career, you will be doing, you will be doing work, you'll be doing knowledge work, you'll, you'll be harnessing data analytics in order to support someone else in your company in making a decision. You know, that's fundamentally the purpose of the work you're doing is to ultimately help decisioning probably within your own company. Again, you might, the work you do might actually be the product of the company that you're working for, but probably not. Probably you're working, you're using these methods in support of somebody else who will be making a decision. In that context, I would just offer you three thoughts as you try to kind of figure out like, am I making any difference here or how do I make a difference here? Um, the first thought is, it, it could be possible that you've got column A of data and you've got column B of data and nobody has ever divided column A by column B to come up with column C. And now that, is, you know, A divided by B is a new original signal in the world, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe B divided by A is, you know, more novel or more consumable. But one thing that's useful is, and I, I remember this very clearly when I was, you know, Rob and I started out essentially doing exactly the same kind of work at friendly rival firms. And <laughs> I, remember, I remember the feeling when I, you know, first of all, I would, <laughs> back in the old days, you actually had to generate the data in column A and the data in column B because they just didn't exist. I mean, we just didn't have the volume of structured data that we have today. Well, not even close. Um, but I, I remember how it felt when I was a 24 year old and I divided, you know, first of all, I, I created column A and column B and then I divided A by B and I would go talk to people that had been around more than, than I had been. And, you know, I just got a sense that, oh, that's a signal that people haven't seen before. Okay, well, maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. But at least having a sense of whether or not it's novel was kind of was kind of helpful. So kind of knowing what are the limits of the signals that people generally kind of live on as they try to think about how are we doing here and what decisions are we trying to make. So that's that's my first thought. My second thought is that if 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 you if you are in the context that I'm suggesting, which is your work is helping somebody else to make a decision, I can tell you as somebody that has to make decisions. What's not very helpful to me is when somebody does a lot of work and they, preside, they present the sort of the quantified output of what they're doing, but what they're clearly trying to do is to say, here's the one and only answer. You know, because it's so hard to know everything that somebody else is trying to account for as they're trying to make a decision. It is, I have always found it much more helpful if somebody who is leading analysis will come and present options, you know, and I, and by the way, what I'm suggesting here, I see this mistake made very frequently. Analysts think I'm supposed to come and give the answer, but particularly at early stages of your career, you're trying to help an organization and individual people make a decision. Think about it. If it, the roles were reversed and you're the one that has to make the decision, maybe occasionally you want somebody to come and tell you, this is the answer. But more frequently, I would strongly suspect that you would rather somebody came, came and said, you know, so first of all, here's all the original signals. That my, my first point. And second point, it seems as if we have three options here and here's how the fact pattern, you know, uh, fits uh, against uh, those three options. Finally, you might say, okay, well, having spent a lot of time on all of this and having arrayed options, this is personally what I would do. But when people are making decisions, they're accounting for a bunch of stuff like preference for risk, desire for return, what time frame are they thinking in? I mean, you, you know, if you're trying to influence somebody else's decision, it's hard to know what their linear program is up there. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, maybe you, ex but I think what I'm trying to say is you have earned the right to express your opinion, particularly as somebody, and I hope you know what I mean by saying, earned your right. I mean, express yourself all day, every day. I'm not, you know, this isn't about your humanity is your humanity, but I'm saying you'll be legitimate inside of the organization if you, if you, if you, if you deeply 
and you know, if you deeply involve yourself with the data, find original signals in it, speak in terms of uh, uh, options, and then perhaps finally you do actually come out with your own view of, well, you know, left up to me, this is what I would do. But I think, you know, kind of along, along that path there, and it's, I mean, one of the reasons why I don't think it goes on nearly as much as it should is it's actually more time consuming to do all that. It's easier if you just say, well, I did my work, here's the answer as far as I'm concerned. You know, that, that's, less, that's less energy and less time. You're actually supporting other people. I mean, if you really care about the people around you and the people that uh, you know, are, are perhaps senior to you in the organization, you'll try to empower them by telling them these are the original signals and these are our, you know, here's a way of thinking about the options. So anyway, hope that's useful. I really like what you said, Scott, and just building what, like one, one point really resonates for me, which is this idea of you're doing your analysis in, the, in a context, right? And, and too often I find, um, you know, junior people, and, and it's just human nature, you're new to an organization, you don't know what you don't know. And, and, and you kind of think very narrowly about a problem or optimize to, um, you know, just to the information that's available to you, as opposed to going on a journey to learn the broader context about how this analysis you're doing fits into some bigger map of what the organization is trying to achieve or what a particular decision maker is, is trying to evaluate and getting smart on the context of your, your organization and in those decisions and those leaders, I think is really critical to make your analysis, see how your analysis kind of fits into the work you're doing fits into the bigger picture for whatever, whatever the organization is that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say the three points uh, that you raised, Scott, it, it actually strikes me if, if our, our uh, governments had actually followed that kind of ruling that you made, we'd be a lot better off with COVID than we are now, but uh, in terms <laughs> well, of response, at least in this country. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Sam, you yeah. were going to add something to this? Yeah, you know, as, as humans, we often look to align ourselves with people who we might think are different. But as you do your analyses throughout life, seek to find the devil's advocates because you really want to make sure the rigor in your analysis is there. And you might be looking, but you'd be looking within a, you know, two sigma, you know, uh, 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 error bar, but you want to go towards the details because you want to be complete and have, uh, you, you know, data sufficiency, but you also want to make sure you have as much opposing opinion as you can, because you will get that rigor. And especially in a business context, you want to make sure that you're getting those opinions. The question that came up in the chat was, how do you get the executives on your side? How do you get the business on your side? By hearing them out and listening to them, you'll not only come up with whatever the analysis is, to be better and more rigorous, but you may also get them over onto your side um, and they might be able to see what you're seeing as well, which ultimately will only help you down the road. If you can get someone who others might think is your devil's advocate um, to actually see your point and communicate for you, that's a very powerful thing. Thanks. Linda, do you want to add anything to this or I'll move you on to the next question? No, let's go to the next. I think all of that was very well said. All right. Um, you know, things are moving obviously very fast in data science. And uh, one of the, some of the folks on the call uh, was sort of interesting. How do you personally, you know, try and keep up with what's going on um, uh, to, to really, you know, make the best decisions in what you're doing? Uh, that, that is a really, uh, I'll start if I may. Um, yeah, that's a, certainly a tough question, a challenging question. Um, I think like all of us, you know, um, I'm a voracious reader and, you know, to the point that was just raised, I find myself, particularly in this environment, making a real effort to make sure that I'm reading both sides or, you know, an array of, of um, uh, you know, content on, on any given topic because there is just so much out there that it's, it's really becoming more and more difficult. Um, even in the area of, you know, supposedly data-driven findings or, um, you know, research papers, things like that, uh, on a couple of occasions with some of the, some of the stuff going on with COVID, as an example, uh, my husband and I both have had an experience where you'll see something quoted in the press and you get curious about it and you'll start clicking and clicking about maybe a research study that was done. And if you actually dig down deep enough, which in a lot of cases you can, 
to the actual data that was published in the paper that is being referenced, you draw a very different conclusion than whatever the author uh, said that, that sort of got you there. And so, so it's, true. Uh, it's very time consuming and it is really just so incumbent upon you as the, as the reader and as the consumer just to make sure you're not just reading and accepting the first thing um, on, on its face. And so um, I, I think that it's, uh, so it's not just reading in depth, but it's, it's making sure that you're, um, when, you're, when you think you're convinced of something, try to go find somebody who thinks in a different way and, and read what they have to say about the same event or the same study or whatever it could be and, and, and kind of draw your own conclusions. So that's uh, the first thing. And then speaking for myself, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, going back to school. Um, I'm going to be doing a program at Stanford, a year long program uh, called the Distinguished Careers Institute. And one of the reasons that many reasons that I'm starting that program in, in January, uh, it's a year long program is I want to kind of be a student again. I want to just sort of forget some of the stuff that I think that I have learned and go back and take courses, um, you know, as with you guys, <laughs> your generation, um, and basically, uh, you know, try to try to look and see what's being said about AI, what's being said about uh, machine learning, what's being said about cybersecurity, you know, what, what is, you know, how is it being taught today? And um, because I think that, frankly, we have to, uh, refresh ourselves constantly about um, some of the things we think we know and um, and just look at you know look at the world differently so I guess the short answer for me is is to constantly be a student and constantly use that curiosity to um, to keep learning because I just don't think it's I think it's just not going to be something that we ever can check a box on yeah I mean I think this notion of lifelong learning that you're obviously embarked on is is just so important and for some of us who've never really left academia yeah it is pretty cool <laughs> we, it, it's uh, it's fun to keep on learning and, and you know and it's it's very much the people are at the stu you learn so much from the students it's not just you're imparting knowledge you it's just that interrelationship between the younger and the older generation it's just i don't know it's just so rich um do others want to comment on you know how they keep 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 up with things I can move on. So, uh, Rob, I think you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it was, someone was going to say something. Rob, we got, Rob I had, I had oh, a little go screen problem there. Uh, I, I was just going to mention that um, you know at Capital One we ha we use this term called growth mindset, which which kind of is a recognition that. Um, you don't go for school for four years and then you're done and then you go do your job that it's a continuous learning um, type of uh, th this vocation is a continuous learning all, all dimensions of technology I think and especially if you want to be a technology leader um, and when I say technology I'm using the term broadly to include data analytics machine learning as well as software engineering uh, is, is kind of how we think about it um, and, and so we, we um, have a whole infrastructure to support continuous learning for for folks in our organization we call it tech college but there are all different kinds of tracks there's there's um, data engineering data analysis machine learning software engineering all of these different tracks with all different kinds of courses some of which are done internally some of which are done um, through external partners and things like that so we try to curate the best kinds of learning opportunities for for our associates, but I think it's so important. We just, in fact, just yesterday, I launched with my organization of what we call an invest in yourself day, um, which we try to do on a periodic basis to create space for people to do training and education um, and learning and, and maybe personal things too. So, so we're not overly prescriptive about it, but trying to create some space for people to be able to advance their um, you know, their own development, which we think is, is really important. We also have, you know, people who get excited about um, creating these opportunities internally and they do things for their colleagues. You know, they set up brown bag lunches or facilitate conversations or bring in experts from outside to kind of keep the organization um, kind of fresh and learning, learning new skills. And then the last thing I'll say is a great source of learning are a lot of the technology vendors out there. We'll bring so so think about you know AWS or or Google or 
um, you know, a lot of data analysis platform vendors, they can bring a lot of, of kind of new, new skills and, and techniques and, and tools to the table to help you to kind of continue to advance your learning. And often they'll, they'll have training courses and things like that uh, on their platforms. So, you know, I think those are opportunities. And then, you know, conferences are also, you know, also a, uh, a, a great way to kind of advance your learning. Yeah. So we're, we're coming up close to the hour. Let me sort of uh, just get you to be a bit futuristic here with respect to, uh, you know, where things, where you see things being in a, whatever time frame you want to think about uh, two to five years. How we, you know, this, these are the kind of questions I ask you, obviously, on the advisory all the time as it relates to the school. Um, but ha in this context, really how it relates to uh, the next generation of, of trained data scientists. You know, I, I wonder myself about uh, the role with respect to how it, it's so ubiquitous, data science is so ubiquitous across uh, fields that clearly every imaginable vertical is going to have their own specialty uh, within data science itself. And then, you know, for me, it seems like our role is potentially as a school is really to work across those verticals, is really to facilitate how things happen uh, in ways that they wouldn't happen within a certain organization because you don't think outside of that, that domain set and what we, you know, what we can bring to that. But I, I uh, you know, that's just my view I, and I don't want to, it's not, this is not, this is not my session. So I really like to hear, uh, I don't know, Linda, you want to like, I just, where do you think, where do you see the future? Where do we see the future? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got three minutes. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. No pressure. No pressure. Thanks, yeah. uh, thanks for that. Well, I, you know, I guess I'd say a couple things to that, which, which again, uh, kind of harkens back to how we started this session, just saying how well positioned I think everybody's going to be coming out of this program, which is, I, it, it's a data driven future. I mean, there's just no question about it, whether you are, no matter what field you're in, um, you know, I don't care if you're an art major, you'll be looking at pixelation patterns and paintings or something. I mean, just, just, just learning how to be facile and skilled with data um, and be able to pull out insights from data is just going to be, you know, as fundamental as, you know, learning, knowing how to use a calculator or, you know, or it's not a great analogy, but you get my point. So I, I just think it's becoming so ubiquitous and people that, um, you know, come out of a program um, like the School of Data Science at, at UDA and, and study these things are just going to be really well positioned to, to be leaders in, in, in that area. So that's, that's one way I think that it's changing. I also think that, like, particularly what we've seen in the last few months, I think in many ways, some of what we're facing is not necessarily new, but, I, but it seems that it has accelerated a lot of trends that were already underway by three or four years. So, um, and I think use of data has a lot to do with that uh, availability of data. If you look at, you know, how some of the research is being done on some of the vaccines, you know, some of that work is actually being simulated. You know, you can test in, in you know, using data science things that you could never test, you know, even five or 10 years ago, um, at least to kind of narrow down from hundreds of millions of possibilities, combinations of molecular structures that might be useful in fighting this disease as, as an example. And so, so I think there is a, a wave of acceleration that certainly has been amplified by, by COVID, uh, but was already underway anyway. And, and some of the solutions to society's biggest problems are, are gonna be data-driven and our ability um, uh, to solve them because of changes in, in, in advances in, in data science and computing technology in the cost of computing technology coming down um, and, and things like AI, et cetera, are just going to get faster and faster and faster. And so, so I think that, um, I, think, I think life is going to go faster in, in, in many ways. <laughs> um, you know, hopefully we'll all be living longer to, um, <laughs> to experience it. Uh, but but I, I, do say, I do feel the sense of acceleration. And, um, and then I think the other big, you know, lots of different ways the world is changing, but I'll, I'll give you one more and then I'll, I'll let others speak. But I think the... Um, 
the globalization factor is becoming very, very um, complicated. I think in the last couple of decades, we have become, um, you know, I think economic need and, and economic interests, uh, almost blind to everything else, grew a lot of interdependence uh, so in the US, for example, on China, um, you know, in lots of parts of the world. It was basically economics that was driving um, a lot of business decisions and a lot of, of globalization. And uh, I think that now we're at a point where everybody is <coughs> talking and, and, and asking themselves, well, what kind of position does that put us in strategically if all of a sudden we don't control our own destiny? All of a sudden we can't make enough ventilators, we can't make enough masks, we don't have enough medicine, we don't have enough antibiotics because you know they're being made in Lombardy, Italy, as an example. So I think we're going to be questioning our own, uh, you know, the, how connected we are globally and uh, how, as individual countries, we want to um, survive and thrive. And so I'm not saying I know the answers to any of those questions, but I think those questions are going to be uh, very much on the table. And I'm, I could go on with things like climate change and things like that, but I'm sure others will touch on some of those topics. So I'll stop with those three thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Linda. I mean, I must say that, you know, the amount of times that data and COVID-19 are used in the same sentence, I think, speaks well to the future of data science. There's just no two questions, two ways about it. I'm <laughs> um, going around the horn here to end up. Sam, you want to make some comments about the future? Well, I think as it relates to everybody here today, it's really about how I think it's never been more important to be broad. Um, this was brought up several times. Uh, from a recruitability perspective, what I'm seeing is a massive shift in how people are hiring. They're not necessarily looking for, they're looking for experts, but the people who will have opportunities are going to be T-shaped, right? They're going to have a, spe a, a specialization in one thing, but have the problem identification and resolution skills, to be able to go in and learn how to learn. So more interviews, in fact, it's interesting, more interviews are not at all assessing your ability to uh, optimize an ad bid ask, you know, uh, um, auction. It's giving them a, a, a Redshift database with data from an area they don't have any idea or background with and, and going to ask them to get some hypotheses and test them and look at things. And these are at the staff level. Uh, executives are being called upon to do even greater things. So I think just, again, to kind of beat the drum several times, being able to have an open mind, being broad in what you, what you, what you like, what your interests are, um, making sure to take you know, the, the opposing point sometimes and be um, introspective and reflective about what you're doing. This is probably going to be the most important skill that we're seeing at least in Silicon Valley, that's what most companies are hiring for. I don't think that's going to become any less important. I think it's going to become more important. And I do think it's going to become more important for everybody, whether it's teachers who had to flip the script and learn how to deliver education online um, immediately, overnight, effectively. I've got two teenage girls who had to adapt to that. Teachers did a phenomenal job. That's not easy. So I do think this pace of change is going to make things um, much more complicated, but it's going to require a much more analytical set from all of us. Yeah, I don't think we're ever going to go by, back to the way things were after this but in many different ways. Uh, Rob, final uh, futuristic so, words. Sure, yeah, uh, I, I love what uh, Linda and Sam had to say on this topic. I, I'm going to describe a little bit kind of a narrower thing that I'm seeing, a trend, an important trend that I'm seeing from within my organization. Um, and, and, and I'll start by saying there's, there's kind of two worlds of data within Capital One. There's the analytical world and then there's the operational world. In the analytical world are, you know, smart statisticians and data scientists and, um, uh, you know, ML practitioners all trying to study the, the data in our data lake and, and get insights and, and develop models and all of that. Then there's the world of we have, a hundred, you know, uh, 70 million customers and we have enterprise grade operational systems that have to perform lots of analysis and, and, and spew out decisions and results in real time and interact with customers. And it's often a really challenging thing to bridge those two domains. So you might come up with a really super powerful insight and a great new model, but if you can't stick it into some system that actually generates in real time like fraud decisions and communicates those in 50 milliseconds to point of sale systems, you can't do anything with it. So there's this great convergence that's happening 
of the world of data, machine learning, and applications. Um, and there's still a world, so I'm not saying the role of the, the analytical thing is, goes away, but, but to operationalize these great data insights and machine learning insights, there's a new way of building applications that's happening that really brings these disciplines together in ways that they haven't been historically. And you see more and more applications being built around data and machine learning models, but at enterprise grade. And so, so you know, people who have those skills of you know, software engineering, machine learning, and understand data engineering and data analysis, that is a really unique space that is going to be really, I believe, very much in, in demand uh, in the future. And it's a place where you know, we're, we're investing a lot of energy, which is really bringing data insights and machine learning to life in, in your business. Uh, anyone who has a 2001 poster in the, behind them is clearly uh, <laughs> <laughs> very good. At, <laughs> this is my movie theater room. <laughs> uh, I'm such a Stanley Kubrick fan. Scott, the last word for you. Okay. Well, what Rob just said to me is just so drop the mic good. I, I'm almost reluctant to say anything because I just think it's so true. But may, may, maybe a way of trying to just sort of illust, you know, embroider the, the point that Rob was just on. And uh, what I'm about to say, I, I am speaking in generalities, but I actually happen to think they're sort of true. A hundred years ago, more or less, the people that ran the largest companies generally were engineers or had engineering mindsets. You know, you had to know how to make steel to run a steel company. You had to know how to put together a car to run a car company. 50 years ago, the people that were running companies were more of a marketing mindset. Um, very frequently, that was actually where they came from. 20 years ago, uh, finance backgrounds tended to really predominate. So then picking up what, where Rob was just, and, and just sort of extending that into the future, I really think the people that will be leading, the, who will be the most prominent people in the most important companies 10, 20, 30 years from now will be people deeply grounded in analytic method and, and, and ways of thinking, basically. They are the people that should be running because as Rob was just saying, I mean, so I don't even want to repeat it because he said it so well, but you can't actually operate without harnessing data anymore. I mean, you just can't. You know, you can't operate effectively anyway. And so if you're actually in the guts of what it is that you're doing, you have to, you have to be able to sit on both sides of that divide that Rob was just talking about. And I think what will emerge as the more unique capability is the ability to, is very organically enter into how do we harness structured and unstructured data and do something with it. So I think that, I think that the leadership, and I, you know, I'm saying it hopefully, but actually I really actually think it's probably what's gonna happen because I think it, it just works, but we need, we need people who are, who are fundamental in the methods and also have a big dose of humanity about them and really are able to think about what is it that other people need? You know, like, why are we doing this, et cetera? And the people that, those who can integrate that um, will just be very powerful people in the world going forward. And I guess, I guess related to all of that, not so much a prediction, but really kind of, I don't know. I find myself wondering about this. You know, I don't know how to be a good citizen in the COVID-19 moment without being able to think statistically and probabilistically because there's so much complexity here. If you're actually going to decide what you think the society should do or what you think you should do as an individual, how do you do that? You have to consume a lot of data and a lot of it is not that good. And then you have to be able to think, you know, I mean, because if you, you know, there are multiple goods that are being balanced, um, uh, you know, health and uh, economic activity. Um, there, there are multiple levels of intervention, whether it's therapy, uh, vaccine, or testing. There's the, eff the efficacy of each of those at this moment. Every, every municipality is different. You know, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for governors um, because what they're trying to work through right now is not easy. But what about us as individual citizens? Like, do we just say, okay, well, somebody will tell me what to do and then I'll go do it. Or are we going to actually have a point of view? So my, so what I'm trying to get at is, and, and if you think about these large systemic things, 
today it's COVID-19. Isn't it interesting at this moment? Like, we're not talking at all about the thing that we talked so much about six months ago, and that was climate change. Like, right? That was all we could talk about six months ago was climate change. Now we don't talk about it at all. But that's a large systemic, and it's the same thing. It's like, there's a system at work. Like, how do you understand it? So my point is, like, how do we not become a society, which is basically a small priesthood of elites that actually, you know, because it's been demonstrated that a lot of humans don't naturally think probabilistically. That it's just that doesn't come easily to human beings, most, most human beings. So what do we end up with? Kind of like this small priesthood of people that are actually, that's kind of who they are. And by the way, you know, if they don't end up in the corridors of power and we're facing these large systemic things, holy moly, where are we going to be? And then what about the rest of everybody else? Like, do we just consign them to, you know, something less? So I, I don't know. I just think about that a lot because I think it really, if you're equipped, you can actually be a good citizen. But yeah. like, how do we democratize this whole thing? You know, because I because I don't actually see that happening right now. So that's sorry. That's not a prediction, Phil. I know you want to. Uh, no, know, it's an amazingly. It's the Dow like is going to be forty thousand <laughs> in five years, Phil. Forty thousand. <laughs> Why uh, not? <laughs> I'm writing that down. Hang on. Um, no, but I, I mean, I think you've just really, hit, I mean, you've hit on something that I, I really am very really passionate about. I, I, you know, hopefully the school, uh, we, we embody this in the school and is that we have an obligation to make sure, and it goes back partly to the, what we were talking earlier about communication, but it's more than that. It's really, we have an obligation to train everyone to really appreciate what you know the data that we have that we have we've been blessed with to be to look at at least at some level so there isn't this essentially the haves and have nots where the haves are those that really understand the models and the, the have nots are the ones that don't we have a real we have a real obligation and i think the notion of what we're doing you know starting for example minor programs where uh anyone in any any discipline at uva can actually start doing more analytics this is this this kind of thing is really creating that data literacy and creating that level of understanding is, is just a huge obligation for us. Agreed. Um, all right. Well, I, I have to say in closing that uh, if the if the, the the people out there in the ether are not convinced our school got to the point where it is because of the thoughts of the people that you've just heard, uh, you you'd be badly mis badly mistaken. It's just uh, an incredible uh, brain trust. So. Thank you so much for, for, for spending an hour in the evening on Zoom when you've clearly been Zooming all day. Um, but it's, it's really much appreciated. And I, I can hear virtual clapping in the background. So thank you so much for being part of this. And I look forward to talking to you all again soon. So thank you very much. And thank, uh, you. thank you for Thanks the opportunity. Everybody. Thank you. Be, be safe. You Good too. Luck.